Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the video teaching series, Spirit-Led Soul Winning. What a subject close to the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 19, verse 10, he said, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. As I taught in the first lesson, that is a an intentional seeking, an intentional search. This is lesson number three of this series. And Jesus sent us to go out. So the question is, where did he teach us to go? He taught us, commanded us, go, which is in the imperative tense, go ye, commanded us in, into all the world. Jesus commanded us to go into the world. He commanded us to go into all the world. The Greek word, there's a couple of different ones used here. There are, there's a Greek word, cosmos, which means uh, uh, this world system, the people, society, all of that. There's also Greek words that speak of the earth, the planet earth, the, the ground, the whatever, territory. The Lord uses these in, in the context of all of this seemingly interchangeably, but not totally interchangeably. He has, he has this that he, he wants to do. When, you, when speaking of the Great Commission, both in Matthew and in Mark, the Lord used the word cosmos. He sent us among people. He sent us out into their society, not to be a part of it, not to become like them, but to, to go out there with his word as his committed people. He sent us out into the world He said, I send you forth, he told the disciples this in Matthew chapter 10, I send you out as sheep among wolves. He's not sending us out into a safe space. He's not sending us out into a space where we are heroes. He's purposely sending us out into a space where people are hostile at times. Is he asking us to do what he didn't do? No. John chapter 10, it says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Then he went even farther. He said, he, he, it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. If I have to protect myself from rejection by not going out and preaching the gospel because of what I may suffer for that. I don't have faith. I can't call myself a believer. I don't have faith in God. I don't have trust in God. He said, they've hated me. They're going to hate you. The servant's not greater than his master. He commanded us to go into the world. Now, do I believe in holiness? and the outward expression of holiness, which is separation? Do I believe in that? Yes. I mean, Paul was very clear in his teachings that we're to come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. He said, what fellowship hath light with darkness? And he goes all in that. That's, I believe, that 2 Corinthians 6, all the way down through 2 Corinthians 7, 1. He talks about all that. We are... Without holiness, no man shall see God. But that's an inward separation. The word holy means to be, to come out from, to be separate from and separated unto. It's not enough to be against something. I got to be for someone. I, 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 it's not enough for the world to know what I'm against. They got to know who I'm for. So outward separation is only a sign of my inward, uh, of my inward holiness. Just like speaking in tongues 
is a sign of the Holy Ghost. Speaking in tongues is not the Holy Ghost. It's only a sign of the Holy Ghost. Separation is not holiness. It's only a sign of holiness. But holiness and its outward expression separation is not for the purpose of isolating me from the world. We're not called to isolation. We're called to insulation. We are called to be in him, protected, separated unto him, to have his spirit in us and his word in us and his spirit upon us and his holiness manifested through us so that we can go out into the world without becoming like the world. The scripture says we're a light in the world and we're salt in the earth. But he said, you don't hide your candle under a bushel. You don't put the candle or the light under the bed. You don't hide your light. Light is to dispel darkness. A candle in a fully lit room is virtually of no value whatsoever. And I don't mean to be offensive here, but none of us are spotlights. None of us are bright lights. Every one of us is the candle of the Lord. Each one of us, to find true significance, our individual significance in God, our candle has to be in a dark place where it can shine forth. And it's not just our life. It's not just our separation. It's what he gives us to say that is the light. The word and the light cannot be separated. Though thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word is both uh, the, the, the light. It, it, the word is the light. It's the source of the light. I can't separate word from light. So if I'm going to be a candle, if I'm going to be the Lord's light in the earth, I'm not just going to be among them, but I'm going to be speaking what he gives me to say. I don't speak until he gives me something to say. I say what he tells me to say. He told the disciples, I'm going to bring you before judges and four kings. Don't worry about what you're going to say. I will give you what to say in that day. Why? Because I don't have the words of eternal life. Jesus is the only one with eternal life. And so if I'm going to speak the words of eternal life, the only way I can do that is for him to speak through me. He sent us into the world. The world is a dark place spiritually. It's a dark place spiritually. I'm not talking about humans. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. People aren't our enemies. Religion isn't our enemy. It's the darkness that's our enemy. It's the blindness upon people's eyes that are, that's their enemy. We are sent forth with light. We're sent forth with the word. He sent us forth and promised he would confirm that word. One miracle on a street in confirmation of what's been preached is worth a thousand inside a church building. The most dramatic miracle in a church building our opponents, those who oppose what we believe. And the Antichrist is the greatest opposer. He believes anything that happens in a church building is rigged. You can't rig what happens on the street. Where did Jesus raise up the lame man? Where did Jesus heal the blind eyes? Where did he do all that? You got a miracle ministry? Prove it. Go forth and do those things on the street. Do you? We hire evangelists or others to come and perform in our church services. I'm not trying to be unkind here, but that's not the purpose of that. The only reason all of that should happen in a church building because the church is full of unbelievers, and I'm not talking about sinners. I'm talking about people who have the word, have tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come, but are not living according to the word. Is that why we, we, we bring people in to do these miracles? So hopefully we can get them to, be believe, to believe and be committed? Is that really the purpose of it? Is that what it's all about? No. No. It's far more critical, far more critical to go forth 
It's far more critical to go forth and see what the Lord's doing and let him use us. It's far more critical, far more critical, far more critical to go forth. Now, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 24, 14 concerning end-time prophecy. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall, not hopefully will be. This is a positive, affirmative, declaratory statement. Shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, the word world here is not cosmos. It's the world that means the inhabited earth. All of the inhabited earth. Now, the word all here is not the normal Greek word, pas, I guess is the way you pronounce it. Greek, the English equivalent letters are P-A-S. That's the normal word for all. This is the extreme. This is holos, H-O-L-O-S, the English equivalent letters. And it means the whole, all, complete. So the complete inhabited earth must have the gospel preached in it before the end can come. Who's supposed to do that? The Lord. Yeah, the Lord is going to do it through those who go forth. The believers are the ones that go forth. Go ye in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. So who are the ones going forth? Believers. Who are those that don't go forth? Unbelievers. Brother Wright, where am I supposed to go? Well, have you hidden the fact you're a Christian? Never witnessed anybody on the job? What about those you go to school with? Do your neighbors know what you believe? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to turn my neighbors off. Yeah, that's right. Your comfort and convenience in your neighborhood is a whole lot more important than whatever. How many neighborhoods near our church have never had a door knocked? How many? Oh, I don't believe that works anymore. That's exactly right. Because what is our purpose? to go gain people for our church. we I acknowledge that knocking on doors may not be the most effective method to grow your church. But what about going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Is it possible that knocking on doors is an effective way to obey the command to go and preach the gospel to every creature? Well, how can I preach the gospels on some island in the Pacific or some place in Africa where uh, there's never been anybody except their tribal member? How can I? That's a good excuse. What about the next door neighbor? What about the people on the next street over? What about the area around your church building? Have we just gone to invite people to church? Have we gone to preach the gospel? There, it's not the same thing, folks, please. It, don't insult yourself and your intelligence by trying to take the stand that an invitation to church fulfills the command to go preach the gospel. Please don't do that to yourself because you know down inside you're, it can't possibly be the truth. An invitation to a religious church service, even if it's spirit-filled, even if the doctrine that's going to be preached there is the truth, is not equivalent to go in all the world, preach the gospel, ever preach. It's not the same thing. Am I saying it's wrong to invite somebody to church? Of course not. But it is not possible for invitation evangelism to be a substitute for preaching the gospel for every creature. They're not the same. They're not equal to being the same. They're not. They're not. And later on in these lessons, I'll give you some personal experiences, testimonies of personal experience I've had 
of knocking on doors and seeing people saved. Now, I'm not promoting that as the only method here. The Bible says, and I'm paraphrasing Ecclesiastes 11, give a little to seven and also to eight. You don't know which one's going to work today. So when you're sowing seed, when you're communicating the gospel, you don't use just one method. And the Lord's not going to use the same method every day. And he's not going to use you in the same method every day. He's not. So what are we going to do? We're going to let him lead us by his spirit and then let his spirit speak to us. How many times have we been sitting in a restaurant? And I'm not even talking about a fancy restaurant, some fast food place. And all of a sudden you're drawn, your eyes drawn to a person sitting there. And then you feel something. Maybe you don't know what you're feeling, but you feel something. You, you didn't just pass by them. You can't get them out of your mind. And this still small voice, not this booming voice, this still small voice says, talk to him. What am I supposed to say? Not your problem. If I obey and go, he promised to give me the words to say. He's not going to tell me everything I'm supposed to say sitting there in my seat so I can decide whether or not I want to go over there and say that. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm not talking about going standing on your desk in your workplace beginning to preach. I don't have a problem with preaching the gospel one at a time. But I've got to be willing to respond. I've got to be listening to God and listening to those around me. And somebody says, you know, well, it's been rough lately. What an open door. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, can we talk? Can I, can I see if I can help? I'm willing to listen. One of the greatest ways to be heard by somebody is to first be willing to listen to them. Let them, let them talk. There are other ways. There's other ways to talk. There's one way to witness that I've never seen fail. That didn't mean they always responded, but it always worked. I was in an airport one day, and I had extra time before the flight, and I walked by this shoe shine place. Well, I was in the military. I like shiny shoes, and uh, I can shine my own shoes, but this particular time I felt like there wasn't anybody there. It was just the, the shoe shine guy. And I said, uh, okay. So I got up in his, his uh, shoe shine place and he started shining my shoes. He said, I apologize. I said, why? He said, I'm out of tracks. And I said, really? What, uh, what faith are you uh, passing out tracks for? He said, I'm Muslim. I said, really, that's, that's, that's great. So you, you talk to people about Islam while you shine their shoes. Yeah, he said, yeah, that's great. I said, that's, I, I, that's good. I, I, I appreciate that. Let, can, can we talk a little bit? And so he told me a little bit, and, which opened the door for me to talk to him. And I said, you know, I, I don't know that much about Islam, but I'm a Christian. and uh, I realized one day, and I began to talk about the emptiness that was inside of me. And that no matter how hard I tried to be good and to do right, uh, I, I, I kept failing and I was empty inside. And, and I talked about that and I talked to him about how the Lord filled that emptiness up one day and I, it's never returned. The emptiness has never been back. I watched his eyes get that big. He said, well, what church? Uh, I told him that I had just been ministering in a church in his area. He asked for the name of the church. He asked for the name of the church. Because you see, it doesn't matter what religion a person is. Everybody's born, born with that emptiness inside. And I can always talk to a person about their emptiness, especially as, as the Lord leads. Sometimes he has me talk about other stuff, but I can always talk about that. Because they can't deny it. They can argue doctrine with me. They can argue religion with me. But they can't argue emptiness with me. And when they look at me and deny that they have that emptiness, I look at, I'm looking them straight in the eye, and I know they're lying, and they know they're lying, and they know I know they're lying. I don't confront them on that because I'm only required to proclaim the good news to them. 
I'm not the one who does the convincing. As the Lord gives me what to say and he wants to try to convince them, fine. But when when he stops trying to convince them, I'm supposed to stop. It's not a debate. And so we are to obey the Lord and to go in the whole inhabited earth and preach the gospel. And the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14, shall be preached in all the world for witness, and then shall the end come. We cannot harvest the Lord's field from inside the barn. Don't mean to be offensive concerning your beautiful church building. But in principle, it's a barn. It's where what's been harvested is brought. You don't pile dirt in a barn and sow seed on it and water it there and hope it grows so you can harvest it there. You take seed out of the field, you plant the seed, the seed grows. When it's ready to harvest, you harvest it and bring it back to the barn. That's what we're supposed to do. We cannot participate in spirit-led soul winning from inside the church. I've used this example many times before. But you can, it's called having the con. I can stand on the bridge and have the responsibility for giving orders to the helmsman to steer the ship. And I can give all the orders I want, but the ship isn't moving and it isn't changing if it's still tied up to the pier. So if I want to hear from God, I want God to lead me, I got to get my ship untied from the pier, and it's called getting underway. I got to get underway. I've got to get moving. If I want him to give me orders to steer me in the right direction, to be led of the Spirit, to you be used of the Spirit, I got to get moving. I got to get moving. I'm going to conclude this lesson with reading Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 8 down through verse 18. This is a whole series of lessons on its own, just these verses. And I, I don't have the time to go into all of them, but as the Holy Ghost leads, I will make comments on some of these as we read. But listen to this. Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. Where? The word there in the Greek for word is rhema. The rhema is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the rhema of faith, the word of faith, which we pre preach, which we proclaim. What do we proclaim? We proclaim the rhema of faith. The Lord speaks rhema in here. I believe the rhema, then I speak rhema. That is the spirit of faith, according to, to uh, Paul and David in Romans or first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. That's the spirit of faith. We believe, therefore we speak. So the word, the rhema is nigh me. It's put in my heart by the spirit of God. I believe the rhema that's put there, then I speak it. And this is what he said, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that he has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So we're speaking to people the rhema of faith that they might believe the rhema of faith and obey the rhema of faith so they can be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For what saith the scripture? What will, For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. This isn't just talking about sinners. This is the way faith works for everybody. All, uh, that's the way the, this is the way faith works. Verse, next verse. For the scripture saith, uh, verse 11 again, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all, the same, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all them that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the word there in the Greek for call or call upon is not kaleo, which means to call. It is the Greek word epikaleo, which means to call upon, to invoke. To uh, It also means to be, literally to be, to be surnamed. It's what you do with a baby when he comes out of the womb. You surname him. You give him the family name. So whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, shall be saved. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
Here, notice the progression here. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So Jesus sends us like he was sent. He commands us to proclaim the gospel. They hear the gospel and they believe because we were sent, we proclaimed, they heard, they believed, and they called on him in the in obedience to all of the word of God. <coughs> because Jesus defines what it means to believe in John 7, 38, when he said, he that believeth on me as the scripture had said. So, and I won't get into it here now, but there is a biblical definition of that, and that's part of what it means to preach and to proclaim the gospel and be able to explain that. So verse 15 says again, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. Now, <laughs> no offense. I don't know very often I've ever seen feet I would consider beautiful. Now, I consider my wife's feet beautiful. Uh, my feet don't look beautiful to me. So he's got to be speaking figuratively here. In other words, the feet that carried the body were the head with the mouth and the voice attached to a person to speak the word of faith to that person, the rhema of faith, that they might believe that rhema of faith, hear that rhema of faith, believe that rhema of faith, and obey it. Those feet are beautiful because they got the word, the mouth that would preach the word to those people. Feet. What do feet communicate? Yes, yeah, standing. Yes. But what do we mostly do with our feet? We go. We move with those feet. We walk with feet. Progression. Verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for as Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. Now, what is this really saying? It's saying, according to Paul, the early church obeyed the commission. Has the last day church obeyed the commission? Now, we have the slogan, Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto creature, unto every creature. But go everyone, go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. If you preach in your world and I preach in my world and everybody else preaches in their world, we can fulfill the stipulation that the Lord has that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, not must be, must be is, is a necessity. Shall means it is fulfilled. Shall be preached into the whole of the inhabited earth. And then shall the end come. Is the last day church going to obey the word of God? Now, I can't speak for the whole church. I can only be responsible for saying what he gives me to say to the church that will listen whatever he's saying through me. But also, I can only fulfill the Great Commission for myself to go and say what he gives me to say. In Jesus' name, I pray that you and I will obey him. Not just say we believe, but prove we believe by our actions and do what he says to do, to go into all the world to preach the gospel to everyone. The Lord wants to lead us. The Lord wants to help us. He wants to use us. But it's not about us. Just like it wasn't about him. He didn't come for himself. He didn't come to be known. He didn't come to, to be uh, praised. He didn't come to be, to be uh, bragged about. He came for the purpose of saving the lost. Paul said it, and... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 
knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray today that you and I would let the Lord give us a vivid personal revelation of the lostness of man and of the love of God for those men and a revelation of the fact he called us purposely, specifically, individually, to individually go and preach the gospel to every creature. And if the church body, if every member of the body will do what God's leading them to do and speaks through them, wants to speak through them to the lost, then the word of God can be fulfilled. I pray these things for you, for the body of Christ, and for the lost of this world. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.